Vector images are another type of image that are perfectly acceptable to use in your graphic arts projects. Um, but what's interesting about vector images is they don't have any pixels. And so if I look at an image with pixels, like the raster images depicted on the bottom of the screen, they are the left examples, you can kind of see how they're created. You have little boxes, and if you stick the boxes next to each other, you can kind of form the shape. And if you zoom out, it creates the illusion that you have um, a smooth edge to the shape. But vector images, they're not made from little squares. They're made from mathematical formulas using anchor points and directional lines that contain bits of data that help the shape to be created. Vector images are resolution independent, meaning they do not contain any pixels. And so when you scale them, you don't have to worry about upsampling and downsampling because there are no pixels. And so you can make it as big or as small as you want without any image quality loss. And so we usually create vector art inside Illustrator, but anything you create inside of InDesign from scratch would also be vector art. Um, we can bring vector art in from outside sources um, to InDesign by saving EPS files and choosing file place and EPS files stands for an encapsulated postscript file. Um, they're really good for vector art and what's important to know right now is that there's no pixels. We'll have a whole lecture on what vector art is and how to create vector art but you have to just accept there are no pixels in vector art and there's little dots, little anchor points that contain mathematical formulas that would have um, information about the shape that would allow it to reprocess anytime you scale it. And so if I wanted to create, let's say, a square, I could have a square made out of raster-based pixels, and maybe it's 10 pixels across and 10 pixels tall. And so if you fill in the whole grid of the square, it would be 100 pixels. But I could also make that out of four anchor points, and I could put one anchor point in the four corners of the image. And the math that's built into the vector would have information like there is a straight line to the right hand side of the top left hand side anchor point that is 100% of the width of the shape. And so whatever the width of the shape is, so if it's one inch wide, it would make a line one inch long. If I stretched it and I made it 10 inches wide, it would repopulate that line and say there is a line um, one, uh, 10 inches to the right because 10 inches is 100% of the width. And then the next anchor point on the top right hand side, the information inside that might say that there is a straight line vertical 90 degrees to the first one and it's 100% of the height. And so it doesn't matter if I stretch the image and make it 20 inches tall or 4 inches tall, the information programmed into that anchor point is whatever the height of the shape is, I should draw a straight line 100% of the height down. And so instead of having 100 points of data like the raster-based image would have, 10 across, 10 tall, and when you fill in the grid, 100 pixels, you just need to have four bits of data to create that square. And so the file size for the vector image is going to be much smaller than that of the raster-based image. Now it gets a little bit more complicated than that, and we'll talk about it when we get to that lecture in the semester. But for now, I just need you to accept that EPS files um, handle, handle vectors really well and that vector images do not have pixels. So um, I get a lot of questions in the Art 1200 class about where to get your images for this class. And so the first thing I want to talk about is like where can you get the images and what would be appropriate to use. So first, you don't have to use any outside images for any projects in this class. Um, we'll do a project, project one has images but I provided them. Um, we'll do a, we'll do a um, a raster-based image project where you have to learn how to format raster-based images to be used in InDesign and I'll provide the images for that. But you may use images for all of your projects after we learn how to format them if you want to use additional images. And if you choose to use additional images, you can't use copyrighted images. So you can find sources that have um, non-copyrighted images or images that have been licensed for student use. And so on here, I recommend freeimages.com, or you can do a Creative Commons search, search.creativecommons.org, and you can find images there that have been licensed for you to use as a student. You can take your own images. Digital cameras take images that have lots of pixels these days, and they should be okay for you to take pictures with. You can take them, um, you can take them with a digital camera and bring them into your computer, but you can't use an image that's copyrighted, and you especially can't use an image that's copyrighted and then claim it as your own for your project. So please keep that in mind. I also get some questions from students that I just I don't know what I should do in InDesign and what I should do in Photoshop and what I should do in Illustrator. 
So first, we recommend that you take the InDesign class before you take either Photoshop or Illustrator. It just makes your life easier because you don't get confused because you know what to do in those other programs. But as a general rule of thumb, do anything that you can do in InDesign, and when you can't do something, then you seek outside help. And so when I'm in InDesign, I can put images into the program, but I can't manipulate them, I can't crop them properly, I can't distort them, I can't retouch them or anything like that. And so I'm going to hit a point where I just can't figure out how to do it in InDesign, that's when you would go and use Photoshop. And then when you're done Photoshop, you bring that image back and you choose File Place and you get it back inside your InDesign document. Um, the same thing goes with vector art. So you can create some basic vector art in InDesign, but there are things you just can't do in InDesign that you can do in Illustrator. And so when you hit that wall and you're like, I need to do, I need to warp my text and I just can't figure out how to do that, that's when you say I need outside help and you would jump to Illustrator and you would use Illustrator. And so what I have written on the slide here, advanced image manipulation, jump to Photoshop, and then if you're going to do some complex vector art uh, manipulation or create some images, then you would use Illustrator. But try to do it in InDesign first, and then if you can't, then seek outside help. I've had students in the past who have taken Illustrator or Photoshop first, and so as we learn things in the InDesign class, they naturally want to go do them in Illustrator. And so my recommendation for that is kind of the same idea. If we haven't covered it yet and you know how to do something in Illustrator and you want to include that in your project, you can go to Illustrator and you can work on it and then you can bring it back to InDesign. But once I show you how to do it in InDesign, I expect you to be doing it in InDesign. And so maybe I didn't show you how to do text on a path yet and you know how to do text on a path in Illustrator. You can go to Illustrator and do that and then you can bring the artwork back over. And while we're talking about it, vector art is cross compatible and so you can copy and paste it between programs. And so I would recommend if you're working in Illustrator and it's kind of a one-off project that you're not going to want to edit or use in multiple ways or share with other people, you can create the vector art in Illustrator and then literally just copy it and paste it into InDesign and it should be fully editable inside InDesign. The only catch to this is if you paste it and you get an X across your image, it means that there's too many anchor points for you to copy and paste the vector art and it would have to embed the image. And if that happens, you have to hit undo, go back to Illustrator, and you want to save your file as an EPS, and then choose File Place and place the file as a picture into your InDesign project. Okay, at this point in the lecture, if you're taking this class on campus, I would say let's take a break because we're kind of finished that first part. And so I would like you to take a break if you're watching these videos online, review what's been covered. I know it's kind of been a little bit long-winded, and when we jump back, we will start talking about how to get started and create documents inside of InDesign.